Good afternoon. I am Council Member Diana Ayala, Chair of the City Council's Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. During today's hearing, we will review the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's 1.6 billion fiscal 2019 operating budget, specifically the approximately 758 million allocated to the Division of Mental Hygiene. We will also address the relevant performance indicators from the fiscal 2018 preliminary mayor, uh, mayor's management report and the new expense funding and the division's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget for the New York City Safe in, um, Initiatives and the New York City Unity Project. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mike. I know. First, I would like to address the opioid epidemic that continues to devastate our country and our city. Contributing to the 1,374 deaths from unintentional drug overdoses in New York City last year. As you know, Council Member Steve Levin and I held an oversight hearing last month on opioid overdoses among New York City's homeless population. I look forward to continuing the conversations about reaching such vulnerable populations through harm reduction strategies. This brings me to supervised injection facilities, or SIFs. I recently joined Speaker Corey Johnson, Council Member Mark Levine, and Council Member Levin in expressing an overwhelming support of these facilities. We also called on Mayor Bill de Blasio to release the results of the SIF feasibility study funded by the New York City Health, um, Council in fiscal year 2017's budget. We know the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene is conducted, has conducted important work developing public health impact modeling and analyzing the legal implications of and the stakeholder responses to, an SIF, to SIFs in New York City. We need to implement every public health tool available in the battle against addiction and overdoses, and we hope that you will serve as a partner in these endeavors. The de Blasio administration has made important investments in addressing issues on mental health Ill illness and addiction through programs such as Thrive NYC and Healing NYC, and I commend him on those efforts. However, I want to ensure that we do not lose sight of the needs of New York City's disabilities community. People with disabilities comprise more than 11% of our city's population and nearly 100,000 people use wheelchairs. My borough of the Bronx maintains the highest percentage of disabled people and with, with more than 14% of our residents reporting a disability. Black and Hispanic people are also, also represent a disproportionate percentage of disabled New Yorkers as do people living in poverty. From cognitive and ambulatory disabilities to vision and hearing impairments, it is imperative that we devote adequate attention and resources to disability issues in New York City. It is imperative to achieve our shared vision of an equitable and healthy city. The New York City Council has made substantial investments in supporting these populations through its Autism Awareness Initiative and its Developmental, Psychological, and Behavioral Health Services Initiative. And as chair of this committee, I, I will continue to advocate for these communities. I also look forward to working with the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities to ensure that we will not only adhere to the Americans with Disabilities Act, but build a city rich with opportunities for people of all abilities. Finally, I would like to touch on a non-city non funding in the Division of Mental Hygiene's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget. State funding comprises approximately half of the division's funding in fiscal 2019 at $388 million. The fiscal 2018-2019 state executive budget increases funding for the Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services, the Office of Mental ha um, Health, and the Office of People with Disabilities, with Developmental Disabilities, but the budget also includes proposals that concern our city services providers. For example, the proposed state budget delays the provision of a new suit of mental and behavioral health services for children on Medicaid, such as peer support and skill building for children and respite for parents. Another proposal would al that alter the early intervention program, potentially increasing administrative burdens and depriving some families of timely access to services. I look forward to learning more about the department's provisions for these services to some of our city's neediest citizens. I would like to thank my committee staff, finance analyst Jeanette Merrill, policy analyst Michael Kurtz, and committee counsel Sylvester Yavana. You will now be sworn in. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I so affirm. 
Good afternoon, Chair Ayala and members of the committee. I'm Dr. Mary Bassett, the Commissioner for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I'm joined by Dr. Gary Belkin, Executive Deputy Commissioner for Mental Hygiene, and Sandy Raza, Deputy Commissioner for Finance. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the Department's preliminary budget for fiscal year 2019. The Department's mental hygiene portfolio is substantial, and we're grateful for the ongoing support from the Council, which enables us to continue our critical work addressing mental health issues for New Yorkers. Thanks to the support and leadership from the Mayor and the First Lady, the Department has had a busy year. We recently started the third year of Thrive NYC, the city's comprehensive plan to better serve the mental health needs of New Yorkers. At the outset, Thrive NYC adopted six guiding principles, change the culture, act early, close treatment gaps, collaborate with communities, use data better, and strengthen government's ability to lead. Many agencies have incorporated Thrive NYC initiatives and approaches, but this department has a key role in implementation and is where the majority of the 54 Thrive NYC initiatives are housed. One of the highlights from the past year is the continued success of NYC Well, a call chat text line that creates a universal point of entry to New York City's behavioral health system. Through NYC Well, New Yorkers can access counseling, peer support, information and referrals to the behavioral health services via text, chat, and phone. Since its launch in 2016, NYC Well has fielded more than 380,000 calls, texts, and chats, has provided over 36,000 crisis interventions, has made over 70,000 referrals, and directly connected over, uh, over 5,000 callers to behavioral health services. We will continue to promote NYC Well and look forward to connecting more New Yorkers to mental health care as a reminder New Yorkers who need help should call 888-NYC-WELL. NYC Well's success speaks to the significant need for expanding mental health care in New York City. We are working to address issues of access through the Mental Health Service Corps, social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, addiction medicine specialists trained to provide mental health and substance misuse services in communities with the highest need. Currently, clinicians are deployed to practices throughout the five boroughs. The department aims to hire core members that reflect the diverse committees, communities they'll serve and half speak a second language. In fiscal year 2019, we plan to continue recruitment of core members for additional placement citywide. During the last year, we have also focused significant resources on addressing the opioid epidemic. And I want to thank you, Chair Ayala, for holding your first hearing on this important topic. Reversing this epidemic requires the administration, city council, and our community partners to work together. That's why last spring, the mayor announced Healing NYC, the city's wide-ranging effort to reduce opioid overdose deaths by 35% over five years. Built off the key principles of Thrive NYC, this effort works collaboratively with our sister agencies across four goals, to prevent opioid overdose deaths, to prevent opioid misuse and addiction, to protect New Yorkers with effective drug treatment, and to protect New Yorkers by reducing the supply of dangerous opioids. In 2016, as you've mentioned, there were 1,374 confirmed overdose deaths in New York City, up from 937 in 2015. More than 80% of those deaths involved opioids. The increase is driven primarily by fentanyl, a synthetic opioid 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Fentanyl is present in New York City's street drug supply, found in heroin, cocaine, and pills, and often without the knowledge either of the person using the drug or the person selling the drug. Provisional 2017 data show that the number of overdose deaths remains at epidemic levels. However, the data also suggests that overdose deaths are leveling off. Turning now to our budget, I'm pleased to report that the agency's mental hygiene preliminary budget for fiscal year 2019 has a net increase of approximately 17 million. 
This includes 4.6 million in new funding, including a 1.1 million annual investment for the Comprehensive Drug and Alcohol Misuse Prevention Program as part of the First Lady's Uni Unity Project. The Unity Project is a comprehensive approach that will help support LGBTQ youth with care and services particularly tailored to them. This program will award funding to seven community-based coalitions to address underage and excessive drinking and substance misuse among youth, and in particular, these coalitions will focus on gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender youth, among whom rates of alcohol and drug use are higher. Just yesterday, the mayor and the first lady announced an additional 22 million annual investment to expand Healing NYC to address the opioid epidemic. Of this amount, the department will receive 10 million per year. This funding allows us to expand the Real A Peer Intervention Program and from 10 to 15 private hospitals by June 2020 and to launch the End Overdose Training Institute to train 25,000 New Yorkers each year, including frontline city workers, on how to administer and distribute naloxone. This new investment also expands funding allocated to the preliminary plan to create new health engagement and assessment teams, or HEAT. This work is an expansion of our partnership with the NYPD on co-response teams, which intervene early to address emergency crises. The new HEAT initiative will provide health-focused support and resources to people referred by NYPD, EMS, or FIDNI. I'm confident that New York City is moving in the right direction to address mental health and substance misuse issues. The same cannot be said for Washington. The President's declaration of the opioid epidemic as a public health emergency in 2017 was long overdue, but did not come with a commitment to funding. Families have long been suffering from the consequences of Washington's inaction. For the second year in a row, we have not seen the national life expectancy increase. We have heard repeated promises from our federal leaders regarding this de deadly epidemic, but thus far, these have been empty promises. The goal is to save lives and create a pathway to treatment. This requires a long-term sustained funding commitment from the federal government and a commitment to evidence-based approaches. The repeated attacks on Medicaid are further proof that those in leadership in the federal government have no intention to take the actions needed to stop this deadly epidemic. It is clear that the administration and the city council are committed to addressing the mental health needs of the city. I look forward to the next four years of partnership with your help, we will work tirelessly to reverse the toll of opioids, enhance prevention and treatment of mental illness, and ensure that all New Yorkers, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, or immigration status, have an equal chance to enjoy fulfilling, successful, and healthy lives. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, and I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Council Member Fernando Cabrera and Council Member Holden. Um, I am so excited about chairing this committee. Um, I asked uh, to, to chair it um, when we were going through uh, our interviews with the speaker for personal reasons. Uh, this is a committee that is uh, very near and dear to my heart. Um, many of the issues that you uh, seek to resolve day in and day out have been issues that have in some way affected me personally um, and members of my family. And so I am very committed to working with you and to um, being a solid partner um, in the uh, fight against the opioid epidemic and um, in, in trying to figure out best strategies for dealing with the mentally ill, um, along with the many other wonderful programs um, that we're learning about today. And so I will start, I'm gonna try to keep this based on your testimony so that it makes a little bit of, of sense to the rest of us in the room. Um, so I, my first questions are, will, will be around the Thrive NYC program. So one of the chief criticisms of Thrive NYC that the uh, is that the administration's $850 million plan to increase behavioral health services in New York City concerns the allocation of resources. 
Some advocates think that the city has allocated disproportionate funding for mental health disorders such as depression and anxiety to the detriment of more serious conditions such as schizophrenia. For example, this year's budget includes $5 million for the Mental Health First Aid Program, which includes a Choose the Best Words awareness campaign. How do you respond to these criticisms, and do you think that the department's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget includes adequate funding for our city seriously mentally ill? Thank you for that question. I'll uh, begin, and then I'll ask Dr. Belkin to add further. Uh, if I could just uh, preface uh, my remarks, though, with a thanks to you, uh, Chair, for your openness about uh, the personal toll that opioids has taken on your family. A big part of our effort to tackle this epidemic and the problems of mental illness, our willingness to talk about it and people telling their own stories is an uh, important part of, of reducing stigma. Uh, now, you asked the question about the allocation of the Thrive uh, budget and in particular to our focus on depression and anxiety, which of course is the most common form of mental health issue that any of us may encounter. I believe that the questions that you have pointed to come from advocates who feel that we've somehow neglected serious mental uh, health issues, uh, in other words, psychotic mental illness. Uh, uh, we've looked at our budget. Uh, we believe that we're spending about $300 million a year on serious mental illness. But let me just say further that the, there is a natural history of any disease. And when we intervene early, a core principle of Thrive, uh, we have a much better chance of having a better outcome. Uh, so the idea that we should only focus ourselves on the most advanced and intractable stages of any condition, including mental health issues, in my view as a public health uh, uh, expert with over 30 years' experience, is misguided. Uh, of course, we need to focus on serious uh, mental illness, but we also have to focus on issues that may come before somebody becomes so incapacitated that they've lost all ties to their family and are in, you know, really disconnected and in trouble. Uh, let me ask Dr. Belkin to be sworn in or whatever it is that you do, or can he just introduce himself for the record? All right. I'm Gary Belkin, the Executive Deputy Commissioner for Mental Hygiene in the Health Department. You don't have to. Be I don't have to. The general rule. I will tell you yeah. the truth. You were sworn in whether you liked it or not. <laughs> um, yeah, amplifying on the commissioner's uh, remarks, a couple of things. One is um, we speak regularly with with these same advocates um, and and are in dialogue around. I think um, sh one sharing the information that the commissioner shared that actually uh, the bulk of our budget, uh, our division's uh, budget is earmarked around contracts and, and spending that is specifically for uh, what is often referred to as a seriously mentally ill. Uh, and a big chunk of Thrive itself fills in gaps in that portfolio, especially around um, individuals who have often been triaged into the criminal justice side of things rather than the public health or care side of things. And some of the things that uh, the mayor announced yesterday is yet added investment uh, in those sorts of uh, approaches. So we think on the face of it, uh, we have increased and have always had a very large footprint of commitment uh, uh, to that population. Where we've had very much more limited attention to are these much more common and actually in, in total effects a greater burden of illness on the population as a whole. So we think we're looking, we're never losing sight of uh, and being vigilant about the needs of uh, that higher need population, but we're also trying to look across the population at needs that really have not been addressed uh, and that can often be just as tragic and just as, um, as uh, deadly. Uh, and also to just remind um, that term, uh, serious mental illness, is often used to mean many different things. Often I think people have in their mind's eye uh, individuals with psychotic illness, psychosis, schizophrenia, um, however, the technical term and how it's measured actually refers not to a diagnosis specifically, but to a level of disability. Um, so it's having a mental, uh, certain major mental illnesses that lead to a certain degree of impairment is called under federal uh, guidance a serious mental illness. And actually, when we did some 
studies uh, of the prevalence of serious mental illness, um, individuals who meet the functional impairment most often reporting giving, having been given a diagnosis of depression. So um, these diagnostic categories often can um, uh, distract from where, uh, just how powerfully impactful um, and, and, and deadly uh, substance misuse can be, um, depression can be, uh, as well as uh, schizophrenia can be, and we take all that seriously and are looking to really build out a portfolio that mirrors the needs in the community. I mean, I, I think I kind of, I, I think I understand uh, where the concern is coming from, and I, I appreciate, you know, all of the efforts that have been put in practice, but I think that as a person, again, who has personally been um, affected by uh, mental illness and the impact that it has on, on family, um, I personally had a, a sibling that um, had to be committed for um, a mental illness that was undiagnosed for many years, um, who I thought was, at the time, you know, uh, a danger to them, themselves and to others. And the, um, I, you know, there was no real communication with, um, and this is ho several hospitals, so I, I'm, I'm not gonna name any, um, because I think it's irrelevant, because I think it's more about, you know, the general practice, um, that I was never really informed about my rights, right, as a sibling or as a family member or of alternative uh, practices for people that refuse to take medication and then are released into, you know, uh, into the streets and could potentially be harmful to someone else. So I think that there is sort of a disconnect and I, I understand where the advocates are coming um, from. And But I do, I, I also get your, your perspective that if we're treating this from the early onset, then it, it, it doesn't get there. But the reality is that we have people that are, whose, whose illness has already exacerbated to the point that they are a danger to themselves and can be a danger to someone else and that we may not necessarily be doing everything that we can um, to treat them in the way that they deserve to be treated. Uh, I, for instance, had no idea about Kendra's law, right? And so I didn't, I mean, I, it's even been um, told to me recently that, you know, if a person refuses to take their medication, there are alternatives, right? Maybe um, getting some sort of injectable medication so that the person doesn't have to constantly, you know, go back um, in and out of hospital. These are, these, are, these are just services that were not made aware, you know, that I was not aware of, and that I am sure many families are not aware of. And so I think that's kind of where the disconnect comes because now we're, we become kind of culpable, right? Because we're releasing individuals into the street that maybe not, may not be ready uh, to, to interact um, with others. I don't know if that was a statement or you just were commenting, but, uh, but you sh the committee should be aware that, uh, that we have, uh, have increased our use of uh, assisted outpatient treatment with, or Kendra's law uh, by something like 23% uh, and also increased the duration uh, under which we ask that people remain in, uh, in mandated treatment. Uh, before this administration, there were no uh, requests ex in excess of six months, and now something like 50%, just short of 50% of them are in excess of uh, six months. So we are using the capacity of AOT to, um, we hope, we would like to look at it not as punitive, but as a more um, vigorous way of giving people supports to remain in treatment and, and b because their physicians feel more accountable for uh, keeping track of individuals. In addition, the department has hugely expanded its ability to, to do street outreach and br bring high levels of clinical care to people where they are, wherever they want to meet. If it's, you know, on a street corner, in a corner coffee shop, uh, you know, they, we have uh, a greatly expanded outpatient capacity uh, with uh, mental health professionals who go and find people where they are. All that said, and nobody who's had to interact with our mental health system is happy about it. It's, a very, it's very difficult to feel that you've gotten the care that you need, and I, I don't want to minimize that. Uh, but certainly keeping people out of that system is, our, is a principal goal, and enhanced, uh, enhanced outpatient capacity is an important part of that. I just wanted to acknowledge Council Members Ambry Samuel and Council Member Van Bramer. And I think that Council Member Cabrera, did you, you wanted to 
So he's going to skip me a minute because he has to leave. But Thank, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, Commissioner, thank you. Thank you for all the work uh, that you have done, uh, especially uh, I think the last time we were together in a press conference, it was regarding uh, uh, cigarette smoking and reduction. And uh, it's, it's been uh, historical, monumental, and for other cities to follow. Uh, it's one of those things that I constantly brag about when I go to other places, uh, the work that we're doing, because we're literally saving lives. And talking about saving lives, I, I wanted to ask you regarding um, uh, op getting back to opiates, where are the l vast majority of people who are using uh, the, the legal use of opiates, where are they getting them from? Uh, okay, um, let, me, let me just make one tobacco related comment just yes. so this committee can <laughs> realize that, we're, we're, um, that it is relevant to you. People with mental uh, health issues have much higher rates of tobacco use, something like 40% uh, uh, smoke cigarettes and people who use substances, it's much higher than that, 70% or so smoke cigarettes, so they're related. We don't want anyone to smoke. As health commissioner, I would like the smoking rate to be as low as possible, and I'm, uh, I'm very pleased that the council worked with us to pass this whole, whole group of bills. Now, now we don't know um, how many people are using drugs in the city. The main way that we track use is by the tragic event of an overdose death. Uh, at this point, Although we know that the current epidemic uh, had the door open to it through prescription opioids, uh, physicians and other people able to prescribe opioids that have, bear a, a great responsibility uh, for this, for current use, but now among overdose deaths, 80% are, are opioids, and of those, 80% are heroin, which is a street drug. Right. So the majority of opioid deaths are now from street opioids, and increasingly these are laced with this new drug and to us, to our drug market in New York City uh, with fentanyl, which has made it so much more lethal. So these are, are Ill, illegal drugs. Uh, the majority of overdose deaths from opioids are not, not any longer prescription opioids. They are, it, it, it's heroin. Uh, and other drugs list, laced with fentanyl. The reason why I ask is because when we had, when K2, when we started to see a surge uh, in the city, at the state level, I mean, every elected official, faith-based, I mean, everybody went immediately to the root of the problem, who was selling them, high penalties, and we saw a dramatic change happen almost instantly. I wonder if we should have the same approach if we know where the source is. Uh, because, you know, we had heroin for before I was born. So uh, it's been around for a long time. Uh, but now, you know, there, there is, uh, they're being laced. Uh, so, and it, making it more popular and making it more por part of the drug culture. So, Acceptable. so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we could come up with strategies. Mm. So if it's medical doctors, because I see in the news doctors being arrested, if that's the source, or pharmaceuticals, or you know, how are people obtaining this stuff illegally that we could, because the gangs are really not really involved, uh, thank God, uh, when it comes to a lot of uh, the pharmaceutical type of drugs, and I would hate for it to get there because once it gets there, then we're really going to see even more problems. Uh, so I'm hoping that we could identify that and work in that. And my last question, because I don't want to take a lot of the time, uh, thank you, uh, and congratulations, and you, new physician, uh, is uh, in regards to treatment, um, are, are we are we leaning more towards harm reduction uh, and similar type of programs, or do, or are we f focused still on programs where people go in cold turkey? Do you happen to have a percentage of who, who's going to what type of treatment? 
So thanks for those remarks. I, I just note that interdiction of the drug supply, the illegal drug supply, really remains a police matter. Uh, but I very much appreciate your remarks, and I'm proud of the combined efforts that we made to tackle K2. Uh, you're, uh, you ask a question about treatment and about our strategy regarding harm reduction. Uh, our first goal always is that the person who uses drugs should survive their drug use. You can't recover if you're dead. Okay. And that's why the department, working with many others, has been so committed to the distribution of naloxone, which is a drug that reverses a uh, opioid uh, overdose. As you know, opioids suppress your ability to breathe, and this drug simply displaces the opioids, and anybody who's administered it will never forget it. And we've had uh, several campaigns to alert people to the distribution of naloxone. We want anyone who uses drugs and anyone who knows people who use drugs to be aware of their access to naloxone. Uh, the city is committed to distributing 100,000 uh, kits, which each have two doses. We are big advocates of treatment. Uh, not everybody who survives an overdose wants to be in treatment. We want all of them, to, however, to survive. Uh, and eventually, people will come to treatment. Um, Treatment is the best way to get your life back. And I would direct committee members to a campaign that I'm personally very proud of and we've gotten very good feedback from, which is titled Living Proof, uh, which are testimonials of people on buprenorphine or methadone. Uh, the fact is that I could be on methadone talking to you now. True. Uh, we, we need people to uh, understand that people can be on treatment and be lawyers, doctors, uh, and, uh, and that the stigma associated with treatment needs to go away. That's the best bet. This language about being clean, uh, this notion that what we people should s seek to achieve is being drug-free, is something each of them can discuss with their doctor, but I would like everyone who wants to get their life back to have a clear pathway to treatment. Do we have a percentage of who goes to what type of treatment? Yeah, we do. We have many, we have many more people on, on methadone. We have something like 32,000 people on methadone in the city, and we have vacant slots. So given the fact that we're in the midst of an opioid epidemic, I would rather not have vacant slots for treatment. Uh, and part of it, I believe, is that methadone remains highly stigmatized. But we now have another drug, buprenorphine, <coughs> which is provided about half, as half again, as often, probably about 14,000 people on buprenorphine. And that can be prescribed in a doctor's office. You can go there and get a prescription just like you'd get it for, your, for high blood pressure. It's good for a month, right, as I recall? I don't know the duration of the prescription. Uh, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it were a month only. Uh, but the, the fact is that, um, that, that methadone is heavily regulated, even though any doctor with a DEA number can sit there and prescribe opioids to you on which you might become dependent. In order to take methadone, you have to you know, go through a whole, um, a whole set of steps. Uh, buprenorphine, however, is prescribed in a doctor's office. I've been joined by Dr. Hilary Cunnins. I don't know, she leads this work for us. I don't know if you have further questions, uh, committee uh, member. No, I, I, I want everyone to know what a great team we have at the health department. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So I want to give you a chance to I, I don't talk think with it, as many of us as possible. I don't think anybody doubts that. Uh, it's something that we're all very proud of. Uh, and the last thing I'm just going to make is a quick 15-second uh, comment, and that is uh, to encourage the administration to work with a group of people that have been here for a long time to do this type of work, and that's the faith-based community, uh, groups like Teen Challenge, New Life for You, if I could go down the list. They've been around for over 50 years uh, and literally touched the lives of tens of thousands, and they have an approach that even nationally, and national studies that they were done show a success rate of 86%, and so I know that sounds pretty amazing, uh, but uh, proven to have worked, and I, and I think that we could work in parallel lines uh, hand in hand together because this is bigger than just anybody could do. And so appreciate all your work. Thank you so much. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you so much. I'm so proud of you. So excited to be in this committee with you.
I Thank just you, wanna, I, Before you leave, I really want to commend uh, Hillary uh, Cummings back for her work on the synthetic marijuana issue. Um, she was very diligent and um, worked uh, collaboratively with our office um, to try to come up with the best uh, strategy in dealing with that issue. And I think that what was different about K2 was that it was readily available over the counter at any bodega, whereas um, you know, heroin is a little bit harder to find, and so you kind of have to go and you have to dig for it. And 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 so there's a there's a there's a big difference um, in how people are just you know getting access to it. But I will add that just a few weeks ago there was an arrest in front of my building, and there was a, a 16 year old that was arrested for selling oxycodone. And it was the first time that I can remember um, that a person of that age was actually arrested for selling oxycodone. Usually. You know, our young people unfortunately get caught up, you know, selling marijuana, um, but never have I heard of an incident where they were selling oxycodone. So it just speaks to how readily available and accessible these drugs are to anyone, right? And so we have to also be holding, you know, the pharmaceutical companies um, and our doctors, you know, um, responsible for the distribution of these drugs. My mother had a, a bag, I kid you not, this big of medication that went unused that we, you know, I helped her discard, but if people don't know, you have a lot of, you know, people that have um, debilitating pain and they get prescribed medications that sit on a shelf and then, you know, our young people get access to them and that's kind of, you know, it, it's not, so it's, so I appreciate uh, Dr. Cummins and all of her work and thank you so much. Um, did you have a question? Yes. Thanks, Commissioner, for your great work. Um, I just have a couple of questions on New York City Well. Um, there was about 170,000 calls in fiscal 2017, fiscal year 2017. Um, how, did, how do you follow up on that? Does, does somebody, let's say somebody calls in, they, they get some advice. Is there a, somebody contacts them later? Is, can you tell us a little bit about how that works? Sure, I can start and Dr. Belkin can add in if, um, if you want more detail. Uh, but anybody who calls NYC well, uh, one eight six at 1888 NYC Well, uh, will be answered by an operator who can either speak English, Spanish, Mandarin, or Cantonese. That's the, those are the languages spoken by operators. Uh, and then, if they speak another language, uh, we they they can be assisted through an interpretive call line. Uh, and then the conversation begins, and it may be counseling. Uh, it may be that they are concerned about an emergency, and then would have to be referred over to 911. Uh, or advised to call 911. If the person wants to get a call back, because remember, people are calling anonymously. You don't have to give your name. Right. Um, but if they want the, to have somebody check in on them, uh, the operator will do that. So there can be callbacks. And I can't remember the exact numbers, but we do a fair number of callbacks of the calls that come in, and all of those are with the caller's consent because, in a sense, they're uh, de-identifying themselves. Additionally, uh, if they want, we uh, there's an agreement between the counselor and the caller that a, an appointment at a behavioral health uh, clinic would be valuable for them. They, the op operator or who, counselor, will stay on the line. Uh, while they uh, navigate making that appointment. That happens much less often, uh, but it is a service available. Now, there's also, they could also do a chat, right, uh, text? Yeah, they, they, can, right. they can text and they can chat, which is online sort right, of. Right, sure. I, I know. But, the, SMS. but most of them, I would imagine, are calls. 75% of them are calls. 75%. And do you have enough funding for that, for the program so far? Is it... Um, Yes. It's probably going to expand, I think, right? The yes. Well, as you know, this is a, a, a prime a commitment of the First Lady, and if there's a need for more funding, as there has been already, it is, has already exceeded our initial projections of volume, uh, we have been able to, um, to allocate more taxpayer dollars to this service. Great. It, um, I, you know, what the Chair was saying earlier about it, it really affects everyone everybody's family, we're seeing an explosion of the opioid crisis. And, and I just found a study, and again, um, the doctor probably would be able to, uh, I don't know if you're aware of this study, that um, actually the, 
in, in um, oxycodone, fentanyl, and Vicodin, in, in, in chronic pain, and this, that's how we start off, if somebody has an injury and certain you take this. But there were actually, this study in, out of Minnesota said it, it really didn't help, those opioids really didn't help that much better than the over-the-counter over drugs like, like Tylenol, Tylenol and, and Advil. Um, are you aware of that study? It's almost like why we, why, why are they manufacturing? Well, yeah, no, I'm not aware of that particular yeah. study, but certainly there's broad concern uh, that there's been overuse of opioids as a way of controlling pain. And a big part of our agency's response to this is promoting what we call judicious prescribing. The first question is, is an opioid necessary? And we believe that too often clinicians have prescribed opioids when a non-opioid painkiller would have done the job. Uh, and the next question is, in what dose, for how long, uh, and the, rarely does anybody need an opioid for acute pain control for more than three days. And uh, we also have, uh, can support clinicians in figuring out the sort of in morphine equivalents, what the dose should be. Uh, we have been promoting these through guidelines that were developed first here in New York City and now have been adopted by the Centers for Disease Control, our fe federal public health agency. And additionally, we go door to door, uh, peddling our wares of, of uh, public health to clinicians' offices, talking about judicious prescribing uh, in, a, with, in a program that we call public health detailing. Uh, we usually reach about 1,000 people per campaign, and we're about to start either the third or the fourth campaign. Third? Third campaign. So we expect to have reached 3,000 providers talking individually at the doctor's office, uh, giving them materials, studies, perhaps such as the one that you've mentioned, and also giving them additional supports so that they can prescribe in a way that we think is more appropriate. In spite of all these efforts, we have something like two million opioid prescriptions being uh, uh, offered to yeah, it, uh, every year. In New York City, we have about six million adults. Now, some of these are people in with, you know, who need opioids. Uh, there, these are useful drugs. So we've been very reluctant to sort of put a limit on any uh, on doctors' judgment. What we want to do is improve doctors' judgment and well, remind them of what to, good to judgment give you a, is. To give you a firsthand, um, my experiences. Um, this past summer, I, I had a fall and broke a couple of ribs. I was prescribed an opioid. Uh, just out of no, no background information on it, just say, take these. Um, and then I looked at it, and I, actually, they gave me one in the hospital. I was, it made me very dizzy and I, I, I couldn't focus and it was, I could see how bad this drug is and, and um, these drugs are, obviously they're overprescribed, we know that. And I think, and I know there are limits, they're, they are looking at doctors that are overprescribing these and they have done some good work. But it almost seems that not only are they unnecessary, um, the doctor could have offered me Tylenol or something else with two broken ribs. I could have been offered something else first, and I was offered the opioid first. And I think we have to change that culture and change it. And I, I think you, you're trying that, you're doing that, but we really have to actually step it up a bit, I, I would imagine. Yes, well, part of the context here is aggressive marketing by pharmaceutical companies, which did their level best to convince physicians that they should loosen their controls on these drugs and prescribe them much more liberally. As you know, the city has, uh, has sued the pharmaceutical industry for knowingly promoting uh, the use of habit-forming uh, uh, drugs on which dependents could and should have been predicted, and many other jurisdictions have sued as well. Uh, I think there will be a reckoning, but at the same time, we you know, we are doing our best to counter market and to remind physicians and other prescribers of what judicious prescribing means. Thank you. Council Member Samuels. Good afternoon, everyone. My question is in reference to the CLEAR program. 
So the Brooklyn District Attorney, Eric Gonzalez, recently joined forces with the NYPD and the New York City Council to launch Brooklyn Clear, a diversion program that aims to assist individuals who suffer from drug dependence and misuse by giving offenders an opportunity to get treatment instead of jail time. Brooklyn Clear is recently run, Brooklyn Clear is currently running in six precincts in Brooklyn that report the highest overdose rates in the borough. How will Brooklyn Clear compare to the administration's diversion center program or initiative? Uh, let, me, let me give this a try. Uh, this is the idea that people uh, <laughs> the key was the key. Here's another one. Quite a, quite <laughs> a trick, John. Here. So the Brooklyn has a program. The Brooklyn District Attorney has a program. Uh, the, the, this was sort of pioneered by the Staten Island District Attorney in a program called the HOPE Program. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, uh, at the announcement of the expansion of Healing, uh, Healing NYC, uh, the Bronx uh, District Attend uh, Attorney, Darcel Clark, uh, also talked about, uh, received additional funding to adopt the same strategy of, um, of, of uh, trying to ensure that people have access to treatment and uh, don't, uh, don't go to jail. She also has a program that's a, a pre-trial program, even before you go to trial to go into treatment. Uh, they, how, at the health department, uh, we are really big supporters of the idea that people should not get, quote, treatment in the criminal justice system when uh, they, what they need is, uh, is medical treatment. And the diversion centers, which you, um, uh, which you have noticed we, probably that we have, uh, are still working towards establishing, help us answer the question that when a police officer picks up somebody, and is concerned that they either have a mental health or substance issue, you know, where do they take them? They can arrest them on something and take them to jail. They can take them to an emergency department. Uh, they could take them to one of the mental health shelters. Or Now uh, our hope is that we will succeed in establishing these centers. We have uh, the contracts established now, and there'll be a place that they can be taken where they can be connected to care and they can forego the whole criminal justice experience altogether and just go to the diversion center and be directly connected to services. Um, Mr. Vope, who's joined me here at the table, uh, has worked uh, passionately to make these diversion centers a reality. If, you, um, if you'd like to ans ask any further questions, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer them. You did so. You mentioned before the thirty-two thousand slots with the um, the thirty-two thousand people who are part of the methadone um, like maintenance programs, yes. and that there are still open slots. Would that be considered one of the um, like plans or um, recommendations for someone who might be picked up and um, well, diverted to some let kind me just of program? Start. Yeah, I mean the idea is that many people drop in and out of care, whether it's care for their mental health issue or care for their substance use. And sometimes what people need is to be guided back into those supports, then mm -hmm. not to go to jail, uh, but to be, you know, whatever it was, their real problem was that they have a substance use disorder and they need to get back in treatment. They don't need punishment, they need treatment. Uh, Mr. Volpe, do you wanna, uh, I don't know, do you wanna add anything to the diversion center would, activities? I would just like for you to explain that a little further because I'm just trying to figure out if the go-to treatment would be um, like a methadone maintenance or if there are any other like programs or um, I don't know, contracts with detox centers or actual inpatient treatment centers as opposed to um, methadone maintenance. Okay. so. John Volpe, uh, Special Advisor on Criminal Justice. Good afternoon. I'm not gonna swear, but like Gary said, I'll tell the truth. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm gonna ask you just to refine the questions, but I just, I will say that, you know, I think as the commissioner said, you know, upstream early approaches to moving people away from criminal justice and into support and treatment is what both hope and diversion centers are, the key difference being one is post-arrest pre-arraignment, 
the HOPE programs, and one, the diversion centers are where officers will not even um, use an arrest as a tool. It will be simply a handoff to the health system. And as the commissioner said, we really think issues like substance use and, and the social need that often police are interacting with people and in the histor history have led to uh, overcriminalization can now um, be dealt with in the, the health system. I'm not, I will just say the diversion centers will be OASIS licensed, so they'll have uh, licenses through the uh, State Office of um, Substance Use, and they will provide licensed substance services, including withdrawal services and the uh, induction of buprenorphine. So we see that as a pivotal point that when police identify need, they hand off, they don't arrest, and then depending on the person's desires, uh, and engaging them, we'll, we'll either use peer approaches and support, or we we'll use more clinical approaches. It's a mix of clinical and non-clinical. If I could, uh, I think your question, all of the treatment options, these are gateways to all treatment options. Um, uh, the spectrum of uh, trying to get someone who's been in contact with the criminal justice system um, the, the stack is, de uh, the, the deck is stacked in favor of them being connected to any of those options, uh, either through the diversion center or through these um, other options that uh, are happening in the, across the boroughs. Okay, I was just trying to get a sense of once they're actually um, um, received and, and connected, what happens after that? Like what type of programs were they being connected to? Because I just hear a lot nowadays about um, methadone and I don't hear a lot about um, funding for actual um, more detox through city resources and more um, inpatient treatment centers. And that's just coming from, um, I represent um, Brownsville and Ocean Hill and Crown Heights and East Flatbush and bed -Stuy. And in my area, I can just tell you now, and I have a lot of different um, locations where we have methadone clinics and you just see a lot of lingering and and I know you mentioned commissioner that um, you know you can continue to still thrive and, and, and live a full life um, but at the same time we do see a lot of lingering around a lot of the centers and I've had ongoing conversations with organizations that are willing to come in and looking for more funding and um, support around actual inpatient treatment and we just I just don't hear that conversation I'm hearing more about stopping the deaths and and methadone as opposed to um, just um, detox and getting people clean and on a path to actual treatment. So that's why. Don't leave, John. Don't leave. <laughs> since we have your attention, since we have your attention. <laughs> that was quite an entrance, thank you. I know you were really enthusiastic about testifying today. Um, but as a follow-up to Alika's uh, questions, the, uh, so I know we know that we've, we've invested $90 million into these diversion centers too, I believe, and they're supposed to be opening up this year, but we've kind of been having this conversation for the last couple of years. Could you speak to the status of where we are in terms of possibly opening? So, um, Dr. Belkin, do you want to take this or do you want me to take it? Okay. No, Dr. Belkin. <laughs> You risked your life. I feel like I've been saying it for five years. No, and, and we are, we are um, eager and we're frustrated and we're anticipating these as much as you all are and I think the advocates are and the public and our friends at the NYPD are. This is an important additional tool in this continuum which you guys, mm -hmm. we've been talking about. Um, so as the commissioner mentioned, the contracts are in place. Uh, we have two vendors identified. Um, we're working to identify sites in the South Bronx and the Upper, upper Manhattan area. Um, and the, we, we can't say today that sites have been identified, but there's, there's uh, ongoing negotiations about sites that are possibilities. Both of those sound like they're in my district. So I hope to hear from you soon. Um, and we appreciate your support going back years uh, for, you know, uh, meeting with us, talking about this program, uh, seeing it at, for what it really is and, and different in, in for New York City. And mm -hmm. so we will continue. We're very supportive and it's unfortunate that we, we as a city haven't done more to help identify locations that would uh, best, uh, you know, meet the needs of this program. Um, so after, let me, where am I? Um, 
So assuming that we're able to open uh, the center soon, how many people do you anticipate that you'll be able to serve in the first year? And how much funding will the initiative receive from the State Office of Alcoholism, Substance Abuse Services, and the State Office of Mental Health, if you happen to know that? So in terms of services, depending on when they open, obviously, if we're in the middle of the year, then we're going to have a middle number on number served. We projected roughly 500 people for the first full year which is a, con we will emphasize conservative estimate. Is that based on numbers from NYPD? Based on the number uh, of us that they Based on uh, numbers NYPD, but also based on a ramping up of the program, um, getting um, kind of all of the systems to be working the way that we hope in like year two they'll be working. It's gonna be a learning process, right? It's gonna be a change in process for police. It's gonna be a, a change in the process for healthcare providers, quite frankly. So that said, we, at any given time, there are 25 individuals could be receiving services. And in other jurisdictions, including one that's open in Dutchess County, somewhat different but similar, the average stay is four hours. So this, for some people, is an important touch uh, point for them to meet with peers and nurses and clinicians and potentially go move on to other services or supports. Um, others who need a longer length of stay, we have the capacity for um, 19 what we call overnight or bed assignments. So the total capacity 25 and bed capacity 19. Could you speak to the funding? So your question is the funding of, we have a commitment from um, the State Office of uh, Alcohol and Substance Use of uh, $2 million annually, which will be included in the overall funding. And I'm looking to Sandy now. Um, in and then the Office of Mental Health, um, half a million dollars. And the administration is, uh, so far, we've been rolling over funding for this, as you're aware. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have any further questions? Okay. Um, so going back to the uh, opioid uh, funding, so the city has invested millions of dollars in opioid-related services over the past uh, two fiscal years, uh, including funding for public outreach campaigns, uh, pres uh, prescriber education and training, and naloxone distribution. How do you ensure that these resources reach a variety of populations, including people on the front lines of the epidemic who may not come in contact with city agencies or other traditional settings? So I think we, you and I had a conversation about this, about how important it is to ensure that you know, we're training uh, providers on the use of naloxone, but we're not necessarily training the abuelitas and the moms and the dads and the, the siblings of individuals that may be using. And so how do we, what are we doing in terms of marketing to ensure that we're getting this information and uh, the naloxone kits into the hands of regular people? Well, that's exactly where we want naloxone to be. For it to be effective, it needs to be in, in the vicinity of someone who's using drugs. So people who use drugs, our syringe exchange programs have been a very important uh, place that we distribute naloxone. This is where people come to get uh, syringes. It's a great place also to distribute naloxone. Probably that's one of the most common distribution points that we have. We've run several uh, public education campaigns now. Uh, the first one had the tag line, uh, 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 save a life, carry naloxone. Uh, the next one were set testimonials from people who had saved friends and family members. Uh, and that was uh, on, you know, billboards and on bus, uh, bus um, shelters and on the, those are called kings, those big side uh, things on the sides of buses, on our subways, and we did do some television time with these. So we're trying to alert the general public to the fact that we are distributing naloxone throughout the city. Uh, they can call 311 to find out where to get it. And additionally, it is available through pharmacies. I issued now several years ago uh, a standing order that basically makes naloxone available over the counter. It's a very safe product. Uh, and uh, the chain pharmacies also all make naloxone available over the counter. 
prescri without a prescription. Without that, yeah, that's what I mean, without a prescription. And the state has figured out a way for people who have in health insurance uh, to offset the copay uh, for, for, for getting naloxone. Uh, so uh, we are in the process of getting out there and educating pharmacies about this. Uh, we want pharmacies to accept our standing order, to stock naloxone, and to teach people how to use it uh, who come and request it. Uh, and if uh, additionally we're distributing at no cost uh, 100,000 uh, kits a year. We also want it to be in the hands of frontline workers. Uh, as you know, the NYPD were early adopters. Uh, we uh, just announced yesterday, the fire commissioner announced that FIDNI is going to begin a program called a Leave Behind program. So when they respond to somebody who's overdosed, maybe they reverse them. And why in the time that they're, you know, dealing with the person, getting them into the ambulance. The people around that person are people who should have naloxone. And that is the genesis of what our staff came up with as the Leave Behind program. That that's a way to reach into people who uh, you know, are active users and, uh, and we want to make sure that they have naloxone. The, the word here is that anybody who uses or know someone who uses should carry naloxone uh, so that they can save a life. Do you know what the uh, copay amount would be? No, I don't know. I th I'm going to say about $50, which sounds expensive, and I could be completely wrong. Okay. Uh, but the, uh, yeah, but the, I know that a kit, we're paying about $75 a kit, so I must be wrong on the copay. And Dr. Belkin has just reminded me that addition, in addition to the Leave Behind program, uh, we yesterday, as part of the announcement, the department will be establishing an end overdose training uh, institute. We work with many large social service organizations. And instead of just training one individual at a time, we want to build training capacity within other organizations so that they can train and distribute naloxone on their own. So we will train other naloxone distributors as well as train people in the administration of naloxone through this training institute. Dr. Cunnins has come and gone. What is the copay? $40. $40. So I wasn't far off. Uh, so the, um, but that copay for people who have insurance, uh, there's a mechanism that the state health department came up with under its HIV drug facility uh, to offset that cost. And uh, I don't know how they figured it out, but if, uh, but it is a way to offset the copay. Has a very long shelf life, I mean pretty long, a year to 18 months. Uh, so it's not like it you know, you buy it and you can keep it and use it. Um, I, I will ask this final question I'm on because I don't think that we've, we've touched on this, but in April of 2017, First Lady Charlene McRae announced a relay 24-7 uh, hospital based support system for non-fatal opioid overdoses. DOHMH recently expanded the program to St. Barnabas Hospital in the Bronx. The fifth site, um, it's launched in June of 2017. Relay will receive 4.3 million in annual funding when it expands to 10 emergency departments in 2019. How many individuals has Relay reached since its inception and how does the department select hospitals to participate in the program? They're all very good questions. The Relay program is a program aimed at people who are near misses for a fatal overdose. The thinking is that that's a really good time to get to somebody and talk with them about being in a safer place. Uh, we deploy peers who reach the person in the emergency department and then make an arrangement to see them afterwards. The numbers are about 225 people uh, have, uh, have been contacted and we're able to follow up uh, subsequent to that with about half of them. Not everybody, you know, wants to talk. Um, and you've already alluded to that in talking about your own family. Uh, but we really feel it's important to, every time there's a possibility of an open door, to knock on the door and see if we can open it a little wider. And having had uh, survived a, an overdose, I, I think, is one of those times. So uh, that's where we are. The mayor just uh, announced uh, 
further funding, so rather than just 10 hospitals, because that's what we're committed to by the end of this calendar year, uh, we are expecting to expand to an additional five to make the total 15 in our, in our private hospitals. The public hospital system has a sort of similar peer-based program in their emergency departments, and that's why the health department is focused on the private hospitals. Every public hospital has something similar, or is it just a... a they've just system? committed to expansion. They also got some additional funding, and they've just committed to a, expansion to all 11 of their emergency departments. That's wonderful. Okay, so we, we're actually going to take a couple of questions from uh, some of the viewers. Um, so given the, uh, given the attack on immigrants uh, at the federal level, what additional resources are now being made available in New York City to support immigrants in accessing free and low-cost mental health services? We're committed to access for all New Yorkers, regardless of their social position, including their immigration status. Uh, and that's what, you know, anybody who's in that position should call the 1-888-NYC-WELL and begin the conversation. I mean, in, in this current, you know, political climate, has there been an increase in um, immigrant families needing resources, children in schools that maybe, you know, are living in fear that a parent may be picked up at any moment? That's a really good question. And, of course, there have been many anecdotes that are truly heart-wrenching, people being afraid to... Uh, keep appointments with their doctors, uh, uh, people just, you know, being very fearful, uh, you know, parents taking turns alternating leaving the house in, in the event that one of them might not come home. But we, we don't have anything in our surveillance data to, that reflects that at this point. Uh, if this ominous climate persists, I, I fear that we will be able to see it in our data. But right now, we're just we're hearing stories, stories that are true, I'm sure. Yeah. Maybe it should be part of the screening process when an individual walks into a public hospital and is you know, communicating with their medical health, health provider. Maybe that's part of the you know, question of whether or not you know, they, they feel a need to talk to someone. Um, can Thrive explore ways of expanding uh, to have a, a project focused on immigrant access to mental health services? Uh, can you just say this, how, how are we working to improve access? So the question was, can Thrive explore ways of expanding the, to have a project oh, focused Thrive. just on immigrant uh, access to mental health services? Well, as I've said, all of our services and our entire public hospital system is available to all New Yorkers regardless of their immigration status. Okay. Supervised injection facilities, yay! So we're all really excited and hoping to get an here here uh, on the findings of the study that the City Council commissioned in, in fiscal year 2017. Um, have you heard of any timeline? And yes, they're, they're, the mayor and the first lady announced yesterday that the report will be released in April, as will the administration's response to it. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. Um, I think I had a question about this. Are you? Oh, okay. So let me just read it because I'm gonna just mess it up. Uh, um, so as I'm, you know, as I mentioned in the uh, in the opening statement, we know that we're, you know, we're, that there was money allocated for through the city council. Um, does the administration anticipate a less politically contentious environment next? Wait, was that it? No, I think I messed it up anyway. Uh, After the release of the study, what are the next steps for the OHMH and the administration? For example, how do you plan to engage communities in discussing the study's findings and the implications? We'll just have to wait until the report's released. Yeah. I know that this has been a, a huge concern and there have already been meetings in my district about yes. you know, the potential impact of an, a safe injection facility coming into neighborhoods that feel like they're already Overburden. Yes. So it's going to be an important part of this process is to, you know, better 
um, educate communities about the, uh, the importance of using every tool in the toolbox to really um, eradicate this, this issue. And so I look forward to having that discussion in my district, but I think it's a conversation that needs to be had citywide because there are a lot of people that feel that, you know, safe injection facilities are just a way of, of the city uh, condoning a behavior that maybe should not be condoned. Does that even make sense? Which doesn't make sense to me, but it is what, you know, um, is being discussed and I know in communities like mine. Um, so I look forward to, to, to the release. Yeah, so I, I, I can assure you that there's a, a great interest in being mindful of, of public response, including the issues that you've just read of, yeah. raised of some communities feeling that they already have, uh, you know, quite a burden. burden. They're all a burden, and we don't want that to kind of minimize the effectiveness of having such a facility. Uh, Councilmember yeah. Holden had a question. Yes. Uh, now the outreach, uh, I know the, um, at-risk population, I think the age group was 24 to 39, or is, am I around that, the at-risk for opioid addiction? No, it's actually a little older. Uh, older? Yeah. It's, what, what, was that, what would that be? Well, I, we're, we're seeing hardly any um, use, uh, deaths under the age of 30, none, and, uh, well, very rarely, certainly not under the age of 20. And the average opioid user in the city is more likely to be somebody in their 40s to early really? 50s. Really? Wow. Okay. Yeah. Now, the creative outreach, like or non-traditional outreach, um, have you thought about? I mean, I don't know if it's an invasion of. I guess it is an invasion of privacy, or like a, a, a mass texting. Uh, just if you have, if you're addicted, uh, or if, you know you have a substance abuse problem, click here. Is there anything like that? Blast text. I know. The city is probably reluctant to do that, but... Probably so. Probably so. But I, you do give me a chance to talk about something that we're calling the rapid, uh, the, uh, uh, rapid assessment and response, uh, which is, uh, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, almost like a SWAT team uh, uh, approach to when we see over fatal overdoses occurring in communities where we haven't ever seen them before or when we see clusters of overdoses, that we deploy an, epide an epidemiology team as well as a public education team together to both go to the area and try and assess what's going on and also make sure that the healthcare providers, pharmacists in the area are educated about opioids. There are communities in the city that have longstanding and uh, a brutal experience with opioids, and there are communities in the city that had never experienced it before. Uh, so we want to make sure that people uh, get information they need, and we are able to rapidly assess uh, what's going on. So in the last year, we've had several deployments of these rapid assessment teams to uh, um, communities in the Bronx. Yeah, I've spoken to a few uh, people who have been addicted uh, to opioids, and a few of them were saying how fast they could get addicted. That it was a matter of weeks, it, 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 and I think that needs to go out. That it doesn't take six, seven, eight months, or a year. It you can actually literally in weeks, two weeks, get addicted to this these drugs, and and then move on to certainly more heroin and so forth. Um, so I th has that been put out? Is I mean just how easy this, these drugs are highly addictive and that's why they need, we need, obviously, these should be limited, uh, uh, it, the doctors should limit their prescriptions, obviously, we talked about that. But how easy this can be. Yeah. Yeah. I think that one of the, um, one of the messages that uh, those of us who work with the problem of substance misuse are so bitter about from the pharmaceutical industry is that people with so-called real pain, uh, you know, if you had an injury or something like that, somehow that you wouldn't become dependent on these drugs because you just needed them for your pain and you wouldn't become dependent. But pharmacologically, these are, are, are compounds to which people become dependent. And it doesn't matter what the reason is that you're taking them, you have a risk of dependence that can be quite variable from person to person. Uh, so this notion that since you got it for a good reason, as opposed to, I guess, what used to be seen as a bad reason, um, 
you are not going to be at risk of becoming dependent. That was just baloney. Uh, it had no basis in fact, and it, uh, it, it, it shouldn't you know it shouldn't have been put out as a reason to prescribe more more uh, exuberantly okay so as i discussed in my opening statement i'm particularly concerned about the funding uh for disability services in fiscal year 2019 uh, preliminary budget allocates about 12 million to the developmental disabilities program in fiscal 2019 and about 17 million in the current fiscal year does this funding prove adequate to, move the, to meet the needs of our city's developmentally disabled population? And how would these programs and services benefit from an increase in the city uh, tax levy? So the, the, I'm gonna ask Dr. Belkin to respond to this, uh, but you should be aware that most of our funding for disability come from the, comes from the state. Um, so, uh, so let me ask Dr. Belkin to speak to your concern that we are underfunded to meet the needs of the city. So, um, and we've had this discussion uh, directly. Unfortunately, our um, portfolio in this area is small as largely a result of the state city division of labor that this is an area that um, has been mostly funded out of and managed by the state office uh, of persons with disabilities. Uh, we do, however, contract um, over 90 programs um, throughout the city, and what we try to do is fill in the spaces where that state funding is not um, capturing. Um, so different kinds of family support, supporting caregivers, um, and different kind of respite and recreational after school activities, camp programs. Um, we try to uh, also provide parent education and training. Um, so it's really working on uh, the support systems to individuals, um, issues needing as those individuals age. Uh, so that's where we have tried to complement where there's less of, uh, we think there's a service gap um, around the state. One, uh, for, in terms of uh, where the state is leaning in. Um, your question about what are the unmet needs is a, is a good one that we're starting to look at and we haven't traditionally um, surveyed and explored um, understanding uh, how those play out in the community than, than we have for other things. And so we're actually looking internally as to ways that we can understand those gaps better. That is a, it's, when I, when I took this committee, one of my concerns was that that was going to be a conversation that was going to kind of be lost um, in the, the wave of, you know, we, we get a lot, we put a lot of resources and attention to mental health issues and to the opioid epidemic, um, but we're not really necessarily focusing enough of our attention on the needs of people with, with disabilities and the, the challenges that they um, have to go through day in and day out. Um, there are, you know, I mean, a variety of, of, of issues, right, from infancy through adulthood, right? What happens to a child that has aged out of these programs and then, you know, is now uh, receiving reduced services and home care because we're, we're making cuts to Medicaid as well that affect family members that then have to, you know, choose between going to work or taking care of a disabled child. Um, so this is something that's really important to me is that we do not we don't lose sight of that through this committee and that is it is just as important as anything else that we're discussing so in any way that we can be partners we would appreciate um, continuing the dialogue and I, I thank you so much unless uh, Councilmember Holden unless you have any questions thank you guys so much okay. for your testimony thank you. today and I look forward to we working look forward with to working you. together and thanks to my team.
Okay, we'll, we'll be calling up the panelists. Okay. Um, we're calling up Marjorie Anton uh, Antoine, Nora Moran, and Douglas. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit blind. Barman, Berman. Are you testing me? <laughs> Marjorie Antoine, Nora Moran, and Douglas, is it Berman? You don't get sworn in. We're, it's an, a, a general blanketed swearing in. <laughs> Good afternoon, thank you for coming. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Diana Ayala, and members of the committee. I am Marjorie Antoine, Deputy Director of Education Programs for Birch Family Services. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today in support of autism care and family support in our city. For more than 40 years, Birch Family Services has provided comprehensive and quality services in education, habilitation, family support, and residential programs for individuals with autism and other intellectual disabilities throughout New York City. Birch has an ecosystem of schools, residences, day habilitation locations to address the needs of individuals with autism. Our agency supports almost 2,000 families in meeting the challenges faced in raising children with autism and special needs. Currently, resources for individuals with autism are not adequate to meet the growing needs of this population. In 2002, one in 150 children were identified with autism spectrum disorder. Today, one in 68 children are identified with autism spectrum disorder, according to estimates from CDC's Autism Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network. 500,000 individuals with autism will age into adulthood over the next 10 years, with 17,000 in New York City and adjacent counties. As these individuals age into adulthood and attempt to gain meaningful employment, they will face many challenges. There's an 85% unemployment rate for college students with autism. In 2011 to 2012, the rate of unemployment for individuals with intellectual disabilities was 21%, twice the rate for individuals without disabilities, which was 9%. Today, the disparity in employment still exists. The national unemployment rate for people with disabilities is 8.6% twice that of people without disabilities, which is 4.2%. Iris, a single mom whose son has autism, once described her son's future as very bleak. She was told that her son would never have gainful employment because of his autism. Today, Anthony is working at Fairway. The impetus for change in the trajectory for Anthony's future was opportunity. We provided him with the employment readiness skills, job placement, support, and guidance that he needed to flourish. Services dedicated to supporting adolescents, adults with autism and intellectual disabilities, as well as their families, is critical to ensuring that they become integral members of their communities. They must be given the supports and resources necessary to obtain competitive employment and be a part of our city's economic engine. We believe additional funding for the Autism Awareness Initiative will greatly benefit individuals with autism and their families in New York City. Thank you. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is Nora Moran and I am the Policy Director for Government Affairs at Safe Horizon. Safe Horizon is the nation's leading victim assistance organization and New York City's largest provider of services to victims of crime. We uh, offer a whole host of services, but I'm here today to discuss our work under two mental health initiatives, the Children Under Five Initiative and the Court Involved Youth Initiative, 
and to request that the City Council restore these initiatives in FY19. This work happens out of our counseling center, which is one of the few licensed mental health clinics in New York that focuses on trauma-focused treatment for survivors of crime and abuse of all ages. Um, so under the Children Under Five initiative, um, this supports our work with young children who have either been victims of crime or witnesses to crime. Um, it allows us to train our counseling center staff in child parent psychotherapy modalities and other trauma-informed treatment so that young children who are coming to Safe Horizon through other programs like the Family Justice Centers, the Child Advocacy Centers, can be referred to our counseling center for trauma-informed treatment. Um, this also allows us to do clinical consultations at all eight of our domestic violence shelters. Um, you know, we often know that it's important to work with parents who have experienced domestic violence, but oftentimes children who are in shelters with them have witnessed violence, so we know that it's important to intervene there as well and make sure that those children are receiving treatment. Um, because if we don't, we know that there are often developmental consequences when young children um, who have experienced or you know, witnessed abuse, it, if that goes untreated. Um, we're very grateful to the City Council for supporting this work for many, many years, um, and there's still more to be done. We're still seeing high volumes of children coming through to our child advocacy centers, um, and we you know, request that the Council restore the CU5 initiative in FY19 so that Safe Horizon and other providers can continue this work. Um, we also uh, receive funding through the Court Involved Youth Mental Health Initiative, um, which allows Safe Horizon to share our vision and our expertise um, by developing clinical guidance for screening traumatized youth who are involved in the criminal justice system. We often find that these young people are often trauma survivors themselves who also need to be linked to appropriate mental health treatment. Um, we're currently developing and piloting a training for providers on how to intervene effectively with youth who are engaged in what we've called extreme coping. Um, we've presented this concept to other court-involved youth initiative providers, um, describing how trauma, racism, and gendered socialization often lead traumatized young men and boys, and often young men of color, uh, to verbalize or express distress in um, aggressive terms or aggressive actions, even though this is often an attempt to um, solve the problem of any fear, pain, shame, et cetera, that they're experiencing themselves. Um, so by developing this training and materials, and we're going to be piloting it with other CU5 providers, we're hoping to extend our clinical reach. Um, so to continue that work, we request that the council uh, continue its support of the Court Involved Youth Initiative in FY19. Thank you. I have a quick question before we get to the next panelist. Is the uh, is is gun violence considered trauma? Because I don't I don't hear enough of, of about that, and I I think that I you know I represent a, a district that has had some of the highest gun violence um, incidents, where children have actually witnessed um, crimes being committed in their own communities and have gone home and gone to bed, and the next day gotten up and gone back to school as if nothing ever happened with no uh, real access to uh, any sort of uh, program or service that would help them address and kind of um, go through the, uh, the, uh, the events that they experience? That's a great question, um, and that's something that we're considering when we're looking at our, especially the training we're doing around extreme coping. Um, we know that oftentimes gun violence impacts um, men of color, young men of color, um, and there are very few outlets to talk about what that experience is like. So that's something that we're trying to incorporate more into our work, especially with um, you know, all the dialogue that's happening now around gun safety. Um, I'm Douglas Berman. I'm the Vice President of Policy at the Coalition for Behavioral Health. It's on. It's on. Oh, okay. Let me, okay. I apologize. I'm Douglas, can you hear me now? Uh, Douglas Berman, I'm the Vice President of Policy at the Coalition for Behavioral Health. I'm here representing our CEO and President, Christy Parquet, who unfortunately sends her regrets at not being able to be I here today. I thought that you didn't look like a Christy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could have been Chris. Um, the Coalition for Behavioral Health has 140 member agents, eight organizations uh, that are members of our coalition. Uh, all of them are based in community-based behavioral health care clinics across the city. Um, they provide a full range of mental health and substance use services and reach about a half a million New Yorkers um, every year. Um, 
I would like to say I'm very grateful for uh, the mayor of New York uh, putting an additional $22 million for opioid uh, treatment um, into the budget this year. Um, I'm pleased because there are investments that work. He's looking to put the money into prevention and treatment um, and not enforcement or other activities that don't deal with real people. Um, the behavioral health community uh, in the community behavioral health community is at a critical moment right now. Um, we're at the zenith of the epidemic unlike any other. Um, in reality, we are threatened by federal reductions not only to cuts in Medicaid but to cuts in behavioral health care services. And we are also facing the introduction of value-based payments, um, a new and complex delivery and financial system um, that does threaten um, our community in terms of having to adapt. Um, we're also very pleased and thankful with the additions of Thrive New York City and Healing New York City. Um, they couldn't have happened at a more urgent time in, the, in our city. Um, some of the programs are rather successful. Our members are um, letting us know that they are th actually thriving. Um, and they're bringing extra resources to agencies and increasing access to care and increasing the quality of services uh, that are being provided. Um, also, uh, we're very fortunate for the mental health uh, providers, uh, for the Mental Health Service Corps, really including and in creating a next generation of behavioral health care providers. Um, it's very important that we bring in new providers uh, into the behavioral health care system. Uh, a recent study out in California uh, looked at New York City, uh, found that uh, f we have about 80 behavioral health care professionals um, in the, in the um, short designated shortage areas, that, but in order to serve the need, we would have to bring on about another 118 providers. Um, can I just go for two minutes? Um, I just want to say that, like my colleagues, um, we're very supportive and we receive funding from the mental health initiatives. Um, they are, the, and there is an attachment in our document about the two, the mental health services for vulnerable populations and the court-involved youth mental health initiative that we get in order to train other, our providers in order to keep up with what is happening in the system today. But we also support the whole suite of services, all uh, seven of the initiatives, that actually are given to no, over 90 organizations. And we feel that this in, is absolutely essential that we have a established network of community-based services. And we very much appreciate previous funding from the council and hope that it will continue again. Thank you, and thank you for lending your voice to such important causes. Um, the council member, uh, did, did you have a question? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Nora, can I ask you a question um, um, regarding um, employment, uh, autism, uh, people with autism? Mm -hmm. um, how do you educate the employer? I mean, that, that, it, that seemed to be um, something that you have to overcome tremendous hurdles on that. Yes, that's a very good question. And part of our program, we do training, on-site training with the employer. So we provide them with not just information, but real scripts in terms of how to dialogue with people with autism, what to expect when they're communicating or giving a directive, and what the response might be back because of some of the executive functioning issues that they have. So we really do a lot of on-site training with the employer. And, and do you, and you, obviously you, you uh, stress the success stories, and, yes. uh, and I think that would, and actually, um, um, it, but it would seem like a daunting task to a lot of them to expand that um, citywide and, and really, I mean, you, only, you can only do so much, obviously. Yes, yes. So are, are there other organizations also helping? I yeah. believe that the Autism Awareness Initiative is not just given to our agency. There are lots of other sister organizations Good. that participate okay. within Great. the initiative itself. So I think together, though, collectively, we can have a very large impact across the city if we're able to utilize and pull those resources together and get into the communities where we're not already very present. Because there are a large number of communities um, that don't have a large awareness of what autism really is and the potential that people with autism have. Yeah, it's such a win-win program. So Absolutely. thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you for doing that. Thanks.
Thank you so much, Marjorie, for bringing you. And we're gonna call up the next panel, and I just wanted to say that we're kind of running a little, we're trying to rush through these a little bit because we're, there's another activity that's happening in the next room at around 4.30ish, so we're trying to make sure that everybody gets their time in. The next panel. Joe Ahan, Leonard Biddle, and Janine Mendez. Good afternoon, thank you for coming. Who wants to go first? You can do it, you can do it. Um, thank you, Chairwoman and the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction for holding this preliminary hearing. Uh, my name is Ju Han, I'm the Deputy Director of the Asian American Federation. We are a Pan-Asian nonprofit leadership organization that strengthens the capacity of about 70 Asian serving member groups in New York City. Uh, we, our mission is to raise the influence and well-being of the Pan-Asian American community through research, policy advocacy, public awareness, and, and organizational development. Um, as you may know, Asians are the fastest growing racial and ethnic group in New York City. We increased about 50% from 2000 to 2016, and we now comprise about 15%, or 1.3 million of the city's overall population. Asians are also the only racial group for which suicide was consistently one of the top 10 leading causes of death in New York City from 1997 to 2015. Last October, we released a report on overcoming challenges to mental health services for Asian New Yorkers, which is based on a year-long study that we conducted on the mental health issues and service capacity challenges that 22 Asian-led and Asian-serving community-based organizations had observed among the different Pan-Asian communities they served in New York City. In the report, we highlighted the increasing visibility of mental health needs among Asian New Yorkers and provided recommendations to address the ma major challenges impacting the Asian community, which includes increasing access to linguistically and culturally competent mental health services. In our report, we identify four challenges, major challenges to mental health services for our Asian New Yorkers. There is a scarcity of community education programs that are linguistically and, and culturally competent to build awareness and acceptance of mental health as a health concern as mental health is deeply stigmatized in many Asian communities and mental health care is still viewed as a Western concept. There is a shortage of linguistically and culturally competent mental health practitioners and services, which uh, is particularly egregious in areas of specialty, such as drug or alcohol abuse, gambling addiction, domestic violence, violence and LGBTQ topics. Access to mental health care services um, is a challenge as there are few entry points beyond individualized therapy and the cost of services is a deterrent for those without, mental, without health insurance. There's also a lack of research into the mental health needs of and service models that work best for the Asian community, which is due to the absence of disaggregated data for Asian ethnicities and funders proposal criteria that oftentimes excludes the integrated or alternative service models that are often used in the Asian community. To address these challenges, the Federation proposes to launch and enhance mental health services in the Asian community. We will take the lead on designing and implementing programs based on our research, which help to reduce stigma and other barriers to mental health services, increase awareness of the mental health needs of Asian American residents, and foster greater collaboration between formal service systems and community resources to reach these residents. In order to increase access to mental health services, we must fund Asian organizations' efforts to engage community members at the places where they seek help. We must support programming that integrates mental health services through other social services, and we must invest in support groups run by Asian organizations for clients who are receiving treatment and or on medication. To avert what's quickly becoming a mental health crisis in the Asian American community, we propose a series of steps to increase the non-clinical mental health services available to the community. These steps include developing a training program for Asian-led social service groups using models of non-clinical service capacity, non-clinical service delivery, delivery that utilize existing services and programs. 
This kind of program would utilize models which integrate mental health concepts into existing programs or services such as youth leadership programs, parenting skills workshops, senior services, et cetera. Use peer training to share successful models across Asian communities. Support organizations adopting these new models to ensure success. Incorporate mental health first aid for key touch points in the Asian community that is culturally adopted for those communities. Um, where people seek help such as social service, frontline staff, religious leaders, primary care physicians, and other alternative medical providers. Uh, our program also includes creating a network of non-clinical. Are you never kind of cut you off? Are you sure? Yes. Sir. Almost wrapping up. We want to just. I. Put in uh, one last thing. So we want to create a network of shared services, uh, shared resources for non-clinical services in the Asian community, um, as well as create a database of mental health service providers in the city. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Janine Mendez, and I'm the director of development, public, and government relations for the Children's Foundation of Aster. In my role, I work closely with the Bronx programs of Aster Services for Children and Families to assist them in doing outreach and advocacy for their various mental and behavioral health community and school-based programs, as well as work with community and other civic leaders like yourselves to ensure that families are able to seek out the necessary resources during times of need or crisis by serving as a liaison for you and in your constituents so that you are able to be a referral for our services as well as build on our reputation in the Bronx reaching beyond those we currently serve. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before this, this committee. Aster Services for Children and Families, which is celebrating its 65th anniversary, is a community-based nonprofit organization founded in 1953 which provides children's mental health services, child welfare services, and early childhood development programs to children and families in the Bronx and New York State's Mid-Hudson Valley region. Last year, we served 10,000 children throughout our various programs, 4,500 of which were part of our Bronx initiatives. Through a wide variety of premier quality education and mental health services, as to provide support to preschoolers, children with behavioral and emotional health problems, children at risk of placement in foster care, and families that need assistance in developing the skills necessary to raise their children in an environment filled with increasing challenges. Many of the families of, that come to Aster come as a result of some type of trauma, whether it be physical, mental, or emotional. Our dedicated staff work with each and every client and their family on an individual level in order to empower those families to work through those traumas and gain strength and healing through the process. Today, Astor's programs and services in the Bronx have grown from a single freestanding outpatient clinic established in 1974 to a multi-service agency serving the neediest areas of the Bronx. Services include collaborations with the New York City Department of Education, as well as services contracted through the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and Administration for Children's Services. And, <coughs> excuse me, Astor's range of services in the Bronx include mental health screening and referrals, school response team services, outpatient clinics, children's day treatment programs, school-based day treatment programs, transitions programs, and the Lawrence F. Hickey Center for Child Development, a therapeutic preschool for children ages three to five. Most recently, Aster expanded its programs in the Bronx to include the Mayor's Renewal School Initiative, geared towards improving and uplifting failing schools in the Bronx. Aster is currently providing mental health training and other services via consultation contracts and outpatient clinic satellites to 28 schools, coordinating with 10 community-based organizations in the Bronx. In addition, Aster has developed a pilot program for the, for the new state plan amendment services serving youth in their communities. The program brings behavioral health services to our at-risk vulnerable youth directly in their homes, schools, or even after-school locations. Aster was also selected to participate in the City Council-funded court-ordered youth initiative that enables us to provide training to clinic staff and further funds a clinician to work with probation and family courts to link children with behavioral challenges at risk of criminal charges to receive those needed services that give them the tools they need to re-enter the community. As as the work and reach of Astor's programs have expanded in the Bronx, the need for space and operational resources is falling behind and resulting in greater challenges for Astor and our ability to serve our communities. Astor is des desperately in need of office space so that we can accommodate our growing programs, their respective staffs, and your constituents. Additional space would allow us the opportunity to centralize programs and staff resources as well as provide the much needed space that Astor needs in order to continue to provide quality services in the Bronx. 
Astor believes, as I'm sure you all do, that every child deserves a childhood, and we look forward to working with the Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction Committee of the Council to ensure that the children and families we serve continue to receive the opportunity to meet life's challenges, pursue their dreams, and reach their full potential. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Carla Rabinowitz, and I'm the advocacy coordinator of Community Access, and the project coordinator of a coalition called CCIT NYC, trying to bring a fully comprehensive CIT system to New York City. Community Access is a 44-year-old nonprofit that helps people with mental health concerns through providing what we most need, quality supportive housing and employment training. Our coalition and Community Access really request that you ask the mayor to revive his task force on behavioral health and criminal justice. This task force met in 2014 and it's now defunct. What we need now is to sufficiently empower a new task force to design non-police solutions that will stop the deaths of mental health recipients in crisis encounters. In this task force, we need what we had before, all stakeholders and all city and state government agencies at the table to suggest non-police alternatives to responding to EDP calls. Some of the contributions of the original task force have already been taken up by the city. NYPD is really doing great training that we want more officers trained. But CIT training alone is not gonna be enough to prevent these recurring deaths. Since NYPD started CIT training, at least nine mental health recipients have died. That's in two and a half years, more than any time I can remember. Three people of the mental health community have died in the last six months. We need, um, we need to support the police by fully funding diversion centers to provide a rapid handoff of New Yorkers in acute crisis from police custody to get the immediate care and long-term connections to the community resources that these diversion centers will bring. Um, therefore, we just ask that you're gonna revive this, ask the mayor to please revive this mental health task force or committee with all the many, many players that were on it so we can stop the deaths that are constantly occurring right now in, in through police encounters. Yes, uh, good afternoon. My, my name is Leonard Biddle, and I'm an advocacy specialist with Community Access. And I'm just going to repeat a small portion of what Carla just mentioned. But since the NYPD started CIT training, at least nine mental health recipients have died in police encounters. Three people of the mental health community have died in the last six months. Mario Ocasio, age 51, June 2015. Rashawn Lloyd, age 25, June 2016. Deborah Dana, age 66, October 2016. Ariel Garza, age 49, November 2016. Dwayne Juni, age 32, July 2017. Andy Sukdio, age 29, August 2017. Miguel Richards, age 31, September 2017. Cornell Lockhart, age 67, November 2017. And Dwayne Pritchell, age 48, January of 2018. We need more non-police solutions, that's the main thing. We need to expand co-response teams throughout the city, add mobile crisis teams, and pair mental health peers with police to de-escalate these encounters. These and other ideas require funding commitments. We need to support the police by fully funding diversion centers to provide a rapid handoff of New Yorkers in acute crisis from police custody to get immediate care and long-term connections to community resources. More diversion centers and respite centers will be needed as we move people from Rikers back into the community. Uh, can I just read one more small thing? We need alternatives to hospitals, which recipients fear, like respite care, where people in crisis can learn to recover and get connected to long-term support. Respite centers need funding. Thank you. And I, I hope that 
that you got from today's testimony that we all agree and that um, you know we're, we're looking forward to the first and second um, diversion centers opening up this year and we hope that the model proves successful enough that we can replicate it th throughout the city. Um, Janine, again, we don't have a lot of time because we have another, uh, we have actually, we're going to have, we're going to be mobbed in a few minutes, but um, I would love to talk to you a little bit further. Um, I, bef before we leave, I will give you my card um, to see how we can be helpful in terms of, of helping you find the space. And um, Ju, um, thank you. Thank you so much for this. I happen to represent a district. Uh, part of my district is split, my, actually my district is split evenly between East Harlem and the South Bronx. In the East Harlem um, part of the district, we have seen in the last few years a uh, growing Asian population that is going without resources and it, it had never even dawned on me. We've been fighting for um, better access to social service uh, providers and um, multilingual um, messages in, in terms of, you know, even in public housing, we see that information is often in Spanish and English and that we're not necessarily trying or doing the best that we can to communicate um, with the primarily uh, Mandarin and Cantonese speaking uh, residents that are newly arrived to the, the district. Um, but it's, a, it's alarming to hear about the numbers of suicide uh, you know, in the Asian community, and I would love to learn more about that. So I, I think that we will be following up as well about maybe having a meeting, because I'm, I'm curious to see if you guys are tracking also uh, as waves of families that are moving you know, from uh, lower Manhattan maybe into the northern parts because you know, of, of being overpriced. Um, if, if you're tracking these populations as they're coming into communities that are no way, shape, or form, uh, ready uh, pr or prepared to provide them with the services that they desperately need and deserve. So thank, thank you guys so much. Next panel. Chris Norwood. Hi, Chris. Hi. Bonnie uh, Cohen. I, I, I am a little bit, I'm a little bit blind, so I apologize. Allison Mahoney and Harriet Lessel. Oh, it has a red light when it's on. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Chris Norwood, Executive Director of Health People, an entirely peer educator facilitated chronic disease and AIDS prevention uh, community group in the South Bronx. I am here to urge the Committee on Mental Health Disabilities and Addiction to recognize the major role of diabetes in worsening and often causing the conditions of such concern to the committee. Just for a summary, people with diabetes have about double the rates of depression and anxiety as others. Uh, diabetes is clearly the greatest cause of preventable disability, including blindness, lower limb amputation, and kidney failure with resulting dialysis, which plunges people, obviously, into further depression. Uncontrolled blood sugar also makes it mu that much harder for people to deal with recovery from substance abuse. Preventing diabetes significantly reduces the risk of Alzheimer's. In the face of these undisputable and unacceptable devastation caused by diabetes, we have absolutely no plan from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Health. I didn't see the word diabetes mentioned once even in the city plan for health and mental health spending, which is incomprehensible and completely unacceptable. Uh, I have to say this is all too obvious. Diabetes is not a priority in New York City, but while it's not a priority, it is a tragedy. Most of the devastation of diabetes is preventable. The National Diabetes Prevention Program uh, is a multi-session course that reduces the risk that people with high blood sugar will actually get diabetes by 60%. This is an extraordinary result, but New York City will not allocate funding to put this course in the highest risk communities. Uh, I might say to this committee, and I'm very proud to say we have done this course at mental health programs, and people lose an average of 8% of their body weight. Uh, and that's confirmed by the CDC. Thank you. <laughs> the Stanford Diabetes Self-Management Program is a course for people who already have diabetes and teaches them good self-care, measurably reduces their blood sugar, depression, and long-term complications, but New York City will not fund that either. 
I am asking this committee to please look at ways that this epidemic does not have to devastate and depress community after community. Most important, fighting diabetes is something community members, including those from high-risk communities, can do themselves. We have shown over and over that you can train local people, including those without a high school degree, those who may have disability and mental health problems themselves, to deliver these courses and get outstanding measurable results and fight diabetes very successfully. We hope as communities now step forward themselves to start the effective diabetes and self-care that is so badly needed uh, for the city's health and mental health. This committee will support them. Thank you. Woo! <laughs>Hi, I'm Bonnie Cohen, and thank you so much for your thoughtful listening. Um, thank you for your progressive and continued support for the City Council for Children Under Five Mental Health uh, for 12 years. As a Senior Director for Family and Clinical Services at University Settlement, I have had the privilege to develop the Butterflies Program into the in innovative and successful program that it is. I come to this work, of course, as so many in this room, with personal family connection. The Children Under Mental... Children Under Five mental health initiatives such as Butterflies continues to de demonstrate that our work is continued to be needed. The more we do to get it right from the start, the less we will have to do to fix it later in life. My goal is to reach children and families before the chairs are being thrown in classrooms or families are at, their rope, at the end of their rope or police are handcuffing five-year-olds. Some of the lessons in our work continue to inform the services provided under Thrive and serve families that would not be reached otherwise. We know that in low resource and immigrant communities, families don't have the time or agency to travel to therapy, nor the trust to seek mental health services. Butterflies provides embedded supports in an effort to reach the most compromised and stressed families in two high need neighborhoods offering classroom support teacher coaching, parent groups, outreach, and engagement, as well as a flexible service model providing individual, dyadic, and family sessions. We're looking at building resilience and coping strategies at the earliest point that we possibly can and identifying needs when they're small and very fixable, or I don't even wanna say treatable. Children don't need mental health treatment if we get it right and we do our work well. We believe that we need to have place-based services in East New York and the Lower East Side, as well as other communities, in order to truly make services accessible to hard to engage, as well as working families, such as the three and four-year-old brothers who receive weekly treatment during the day at their school because their parents can't get to treatment after working a long day and traveling and commuting. A recent example of an immigrant mother with persistent mental health needs and a child with significant attachment issues finally engaged in dyadic treatment after three years of tenuous engagement in our other early childhood programs. Butterflies provided case consultation from the start. Although the family, the staff of these programs identified this family as a family in need of referral, she wasn't willing to engage until she developed the trust to engage after casual encounters over three years. Now she's in treatment and things are going very well. So we have an opportunity here. Butterflies has learned through practice that services are best when they're place-based and target the children in his or her life meaning that the port of entry must be where parents feel comfortable, safe, and hopeful, and services need to be local and accessible. Thank you. Hi, my name is Harriet LaSalle, and I'm the Director of Government Contracts and Advocacy at JCCA. I want to thank the committee chair, Council Member Ayala, uh, for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. Uh, JCC is very appreciative of the council's interest in issues facing court-involved youth. I'm not gonna read my testimony as is um, 
just in the interest of time. Uh, just a short introduction to JCCA. We are one of the um, oldest child and family serving organizations in the nation. We provide comprehensive care to thousands of children, young people, and families who come from New York's diverse communities, and especially those struggling with poverty, developmental disabilities, and complex um, uh, mental illness. Our programs include foster and residential care, prevention ser preventive services, educational assistance and remediation, case management for young people with mental health challenges, and services to families to prevent child abuse um, and maltreatment. Um, I am here today to support the request of the Court Involved Youth and Mental Health Initiative in the amount of $2.5 million for FY19. The Court Involved Youth and Mental Health Initiative is a citywide initiative that assesses risk for mental health concerns and connects court involved youth with nonprofits who are familiar with city and state agencies. The initiative also provides family counseling and respite services to families of court involved youth. These services are essential for, prevention, for preventing entry and reentry into the juvenile justice system. Um, At-risk youth often lack access to mental health services, family counseling, or other supports that will keep them from juvenile detention. Uh, the Council's Court Involved Youth and Mental Health Initiative addresses that lack of access through best practices in support services and referrals. Um, JCC is, was fortunate enough, is fortunate enough to be one of the nonprofit partners in the in the initiative, our program entitled Second Chances operates out of our Brooklyn office and provides services to youth referred throughout the borough. The purpose is to identify, engage, and offer services to youth 12 to 16 who are actively involved or at risk of involvement with the justice system and may be struggling with personal or mental health um, issues. The program includes outreach, screenings, crisis intervention, preparatory counseling, linkages or referrals to programs that meet the needs, and a 12-week leadership group. Um, well, I'm running out of time. A young woman named Leslie is uh, someone that we uh, saw in our program. She was 12 years old when she was, when she was referred by her school. Um, her early life was traumatic, and she was removed from her biological family and adopted at the age of four. She was in a lot of trouble in school related to the trauma that she experienced in her early years. And I'm just gonna do a real quick recap. And as a result um, of attending for six months, has not been stealing, has not been having the angry outbursts and the other things that referred and that she's recently been accepted in her first choice for high school. Um, in its fifth year of operation, uh, JCC will work to continue to um, engage uh, young people with these issues into our program. Uh, with any additional funding, we will increase the vocational component because we know that that is something that attracts young people to the program um, and keeps them busy and actively engaged. So um, we uh, respectfully request that the council uh, fund the Court Involved Youth and Mental Health Initiative at the $2.5 million request. And thank you. Thank you. We'd like to add someone else to the panel. Alison uh, Mahoney. Good afternoon, Chair Chairwoman Ayala and members of the Mental Health Committee. My name is Allison Mahoney. I am the Manager of Accessibility at Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, a member of the Cultural Institutions Group. On behalf of Lincoln Center and the CIG, I want to thank you for the Council's longstanding leadership and support. In particular, we want to thank the committee for its support of Lincoln Center's program, Serving Kids with Autism, and our program, Serving Seniors with Dementia. In FY18, we were fortunate to receive $55,000 from the Council's Autism Awareness Initiative. We also received $51,500 from the Council's Geriatric Mental Health Initiative. We are here to request that the Council continue this funding in FY19. Please also support the CIG's request that you baseline the $10 million received in FY18 and that an additional $20 million be al allocated for all cultural organizations, providing a means of implementing the City's cultural plan. 
Continued funding in FY19 from the Council's Autism Awareness, Awareness Initiative would allow Lincoln Center to serve more kids with autism through Lincoln Center's Passport to the Arts program. Through partnerships with families, schools, and CBOs like Synergia in East Harlem, Passport to the Arts provides kids with autism or other disabilities free, supported access to Lincoln Center's performances. Next month, through Passport, 20 families with kids with autism will get free access to Lincoln Center's Big Umbrella Festival, a month-long festival that is the first of its kind for kids on the autism spectrum. In FY18, over 13,000 free tickets to Passport performances were requested, but due to limited funding, only over 2,000 were made available. With continued support in FY19 from the Council's Autism Awareness Initiative, we can address this unmet demand and make this an invaluable program available to more kids with autism across New York. Continued funding in FY19 from the Council's Autism Awareness Initiative would also support students with autism enrolled in Lincoln Center's Access Ambassadors Job Training Program. In partnership with CBOs and District 75 schools, Lincoln Center's Access Ambassador Program provides weekly hands-on job training to students with autism and other disabilities. According to the University of Miami Center for Autism and Related Disabilities, 80 to 90% of young adults with autism are unemployed or underemployed. Access Ambassador's mission is to address this growing crisis. A teacher at a participating school noted that students in our program showed, quote, beautiful growth from day one, opening up socially, interacting with people appropriately, and feeling more comfortable. Finally, an increase in our past support from the Council's Geriatric Mental Health Initiative would allow Lincoln Center Moments programming to continue serving with seniors with dementia. Lincoln Center Moments provides a free, supported setting for seniors with dementia to enjoy live performances at Lincoln Center and their positive effect on the brain and quality of life. Surveyed participants noted that their loved one with dementia, quote, came alive during performances, engaging with the music, movement, and discussion in unexpected ways. As discussed in FY18, we were fortunate to receive $55,000 from the Council's Autism Awareness Initiative for our program serving kids with autism, and we also received $51,500 from the Council's Geriatric Mental Health Initiative for our program serving seniors with dementia. Please support our request that this funding continue in FY19 and increase for our program serving seniors with dementia. As discussed, please also support the CIG's request that you baseline the $10 million received in FY18 and that an additional $20 million be allocated for all cultural organizations providing a means of implementing the city's cultural plan. On behalf of Lincoln Center, thank you for your support and consideration. Thank you guys so much. Um, we only have a few minutes, so we have just enough time to, for the next panel uh, to come up, but I, I wanted to just, again, to reiterate how, how grateful we are to have you guys out on the front lines, and uh, if there's an opportunity for a meeting um, independent of this hearing that I am, my doors are open um, and I'm here to listen and I, I appreciate uh, the testimony today because it does help to inform our decision making as we go into the budget season. So thank you so, all so much because you all provide a very critical service. Thank you. Thank you. The next panelists are Reed uh, Vreeland, Jerry Wesley, and Alan Ross. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, and thank you for this opportunity to testify. I am Jerry Wesley, healthcare transformation futurist at Get Healthier Care uh, Together, Inc. Uh, we specialize in satisfying customer care outcomes, healthifying workforce engagement and development, and restoring organizational financial health. One of the most overlooked populations when it comes to health 
and uh, health and mental health spending is the health care worker who often suffer in silence uh, with mental health challenges on the job with little or no recourse. Here's the problem. Since the Affordable Care Act was signed in 2010, the health care landscape has been shifting towards higher quality, safety, value, and healthier outcomes. These new regulatory demands are attached to models of care that come with payment models that are now used to generate revenue. Optimizing these payment models requires a performance level that the current knowledge and skills of our workforce can't scale. Unable to generate enough revenue through, work, through the workforce, New York City Health and Hospital Corporation that serves uh, a huge mental health population is counting on layoffs through attrition to help balance their books, leaving the remaining workforce to face unrealistic performance expectations and unproductive workloads that put their safety and patient care at risk. We got here because the collective response of New York City Health and Hospital Corporation to meet these new demands has been drastically too slow. So much so that no one has adequately prepared our workforce for the new healthcare landscape. For this reason, New York City Health and Hospital Corporation is struggling to provide care, losing hundreds of millions of dollars it could otherwise be saving. Of the 34, the 34 one-star hospitals in New York State, out of a five-star CMS rating system, New York City Health and Hospital Corporation has eight of them. Lincoln, Jacoby, Elmhurst, Coney Island, Kings County, Bellevue, Queens Hospital, and Harlem Center. And this puts our workforce in a very, very difficult challenge to be able to scale the payment models that are required to be successful. The following description of performance rating that describes the quality of care. Five star is excellence. Above average is a four star. Three star average, two star below average, one star poor. We are seeking $40 million to upgrade New York City Health and Hospital uh, star rating performance from a one star to a three to five star within three years. We're also seeking $40 million to retrofit the New York City Health and Hospital workforce and address some of the mental health challenges that folks are suffering in silence in order to optimize health outcome results that the city and a lot of the underserved communities rely on for care. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, thank you, Council Ca Councilwoman uh, and Chair Ayala for uh, hearing my testimony today. Um, the testimony in front of you is actually, I, I did a, a printed accidentally uh, the health uh, testimony, but I'm going to send you the, the uh, mental health testimony tomorrow. Um, luckily, the first page overlaps exactly, so that's what I'm going to be <laughs> talking about today. Um, so my name is Reed Vreeland. I'm here uh, with Housing Works, a healing community of people living with and affected by HIV AIDS. We provide a range of integrated services for low-income New Yorkers uh, living with and at risk from, for HIV, from housing to medical and behavioral care to job training. Um, I'm here today uh, to talk about the, the New York City uh, overdose epidemic, uh, which killed 1,374 uh, New Yorkers in 2016. And that's a 46% increase, and we know we've spoken about it a lot today. This amounts to nearly four drug overdose deaths every single day, including the day today we spent um, with this hearing. New York City must undertake new evidence-based approaches to preventing overdose deaths by conducting a closely monitored two-year pilot of supervised consumption sites in New York City to research the impact of supervised injection facilities on reducing drug overdose death, HIV, and hepatitis C, and other negative health outcomes. 
Supervised consumption sites are places where people can use pre-obtained drugs in a controlled environment with support from staff trained to help participants to make sure their drug use is safer and, uh, with, and to link them to healthcare services, including drug treatment and social services, including housing. Internationally, there are more than 100 supervised consumption sites uh, in more than 60 cities across the world. And there's an appendix with more details. Um, just to be clear, and I've included some of the literature on this, safer consumption spaces are effective at reducing risk behaviors associated with hepatitis C and HIV infection, preventing fatal opioid overdoses, and injecting related hospitalizations, um, decreasing improper syringe disposal and public injection use, increasing linkage to health care and education as well as social services for populations most likely to overdose or con contract bloodborne diseases, increasing engagement in treatment including opioid antagonist therapy and detox. So we can reduce overdoses, improve health with this, uh, su these supervised consumption sites. Um, they do not increase crime or nuisance. They do not uh, increase relapse or uh, decrease rehabilitation. Um, they do not increase initiation of injection use. Um, if this is good enough for Switzerland, Germany, other places around the world, New York City really needs to be looking at this as a serious uh, intervention to a very serious problem. Uh, I've lost uh, high school and middle school friends to overdose. Um, you know, like I said, four overdoses uh, every single day. This, the time is ticking, and if we keep on looking at the same interventions, we will have the same uh, results. I think it's very important to hear directly from people who are actively using drugs or are recently used drugs. Um, we should have a separate committee just to hear from them and hear what's going to work for them. So thank you so much for listening today. Yeah. <laughs> I could do stereo. Uh, um, I'm going to do uh, the abbreviated version of the testimony you have. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, uh, you and your staff for giving us the opportunity uh, to present today. My name is Alan Ross. I'm the executive director of Samaritan Suicide Prevention Center. As you know, the latest statistics show that suicide, the tragic and ultimate symbol of untreated mental health, has increased in New York City for three straight years and now leads to almost as many deaths each year as homicide and automobile accidents combined. And that is before you factor in the devastation caused by the current opioid epidemic. For 35 years, Samaritans has worked to alleviate suffering, prevent suicide, and save lives in New York City by providing immediate and ongoing support to those in distress, a path to healing for those touched by suicide, training in the keys to effective interventions for health providers, and caring in confidential alternatives to clinical government-run programs and services for the underserved, untreated, and those most impacted by suicide. Over that time, Samaritans has operated the city's confidential 24-hour suicide prevention hotline, which has responded to over 1.3 million calls, providing a safety net for New Yorkers who are isolated, impacted by stigma, resistant to seeking care, or who don't know where to turn. To Samaritans hotline volunteers, all caring members of New York City's diverse cultural communities, suicide prevention is personal. We hear the voices of the people who are on distri in distress, who are having trouble coping. We hear the anguish. We hear the pain. We hear callers talk about feeling lost and alone, their sense of helplessness and hopelessness, belief that no one understands. And we listen knowing, as we learn in our hotline training, if you're afraid of the dark, it's better to be sitting holding someone's hand than sitting alone. We also learn about sensitivity, the ability to receive signals, how you can't be listening if you're doing all the talking, but how many of us, no matter what our education and training, are really good listeners. The fact is that hotline evaluations have found that well-trained volunteers are more effective than their clinical counterparts. 
Sometimes, especially when a person is in distress, a calm, caring voice that is accepting and non-judgmental is just what is needed. And this is an important fact when you consider uh, recent Harvard research that suggests as many as half those people who attempt suicide make that decision within 60 minutes of considering it, which changes a lot of the advanced planning about suicide prevention and training and, and uh, assessment. But unfortunately, instead of supporting Samaritan's volunteers' devoted efforts to prevent suicide and save lives in New York City for the past 35 years, the mayor's budget decisions find us fighting to survive each year, forced to petition this very council to restore the hotline funding that was taken away and repurposed for Thrive, which is rather self-defeating when you consider Samaritans is already doing what the mayor says needs to be done. That means each year Samaritans has less funding to provide services, uh, less ability to meet the growing need for suicide prevention. So we turn to the City Council to once again support and uh, restore, uh, as you have the last three years, the $347,000 in hotline funding and help us to maintain this quality community-based crisis response service. We applaud the Council's continued leadership in advancing suicide prevention and thank you for your continued support for the work of Samaritans. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have two panelists left and then we have to really run out of here because we're going to get kicked out any second. Thank you guys so much. Uh, Donna Silkmar and Kevin Allen. All right, so good afternoon, mental health, um, development, disability, alcoholism, substance abuse, and disability service committee chairwoman, Diana Ayala, and distinguished members of the committee. It is the honor of Local 372, New York City Board of Education Employees, District Council 37, ask me to present testimony on behalf of the 279 substance abuse prevention intervention specialists, otherwise known as SAPIS, we represent under the leadership of President Sean D. Francois I. My name is Donna Tillman. I am the chapter secretary for SAPIS, and this is Mr. Kevin Allen, who is the, um, the uh, chapter chairperson uh, for SAPIS. We're here to let you know that SAPIS provides an essential prevention and intervention services for 1.2 million public school uh, students. Um, we use a evidence-based curriculum um, to teach children the effects of drug use. We also teach the children, we work, we, there's uh, a curriculum, one of our curriculum is called Life Skills. We talk about self-esteem, how to make decisions. We talk about peer pressure, learn how to be assertive, solve and resolve um, problems. Um, as I stated before in our title, that we do prevention services. We also do counseling with our, with our students. We believe in prevention because if our students can be educated about the um, effects of drugs and the type of decisions that they make and learn how to cope with any issues that they're having in addition to knowing that they have someone at the school, which SAP is, um, to speak to in counseling, that we can prevent some students later on becoming alcoholics or becoming drug addicts. Um, and Mr. Allen will pick it up from here. Once again, thank you for inviting us to speak. Um, once upon a time, there were over 1,200 SAPIS in the New York City schools. There are 1.2 million students. There are 1,800 schools. And now, as of 2018, there are less than 300. SAPIS counselors, there's 271 to 279. As, as you know by now, we're also dealing with the opioid epidemic. And we're figuring out ways to combat that. And one of the ways we found it is through the evidence-based curriculum, along with being counselors. What makes us different is that we are employed 12 months a year. We handle the complete K through 12 grade systems. 
we deal with, we deal in each and every segment of each and every neighborhood, and we have found that the more that we connect an evidence-based curriculum along with positive alternatives, along with social skills training, a lot of our evidence-based material lies in a balance between speaking on the the dangers of the various drugs that we're talking about, but also aligning it with problem solving, decision making, ads and advertisements in America, anger control, coping skills, resistance skills, those type of things, because we notice if we focus on what you want to do and we become very proactive with that, we don't have to worry about what you will not do. So we're a passionate group, we're, but we're also a, a empathetic group in reference to the plight of New York City and our children, and we're so excited that we can do more with more. It does not mean we're going to stop doing what we're doing, and the program is over 40 years old in the New York City Department of Education. We will continue to strive, and with greater resources, we can reach to a greater amount of children. If you look at 1,800 schools co-located along 1.2 million students, and it's 279 of us, that spreads the net rather thin. Thank you. Do you have a, do you have a fiscal ask? Are you asking for restoration of, of funding no. for this program? Are you asking for an enhancement? Well, at this point, at this point now, we are seeing that it is a balance between the allocated funding from New York City and also from OASIS, the Office of Alcohol and Substance Abuse Services. So what we're trying to do recently, we had a group of passionate, strong, highly educated people we were able to hire because of the renewal program. We were able to add 50, 50 new counselors along with that because it took at least three to seven years since the last time we were able to do that. Less than a decade ago, it was 1,200 of us. Of recent, it was 500 of us. We are now excited that we're able to bring the number back up to 271. And yes, our course is 71,000 with salary for an average sappers. And, and because of that, we're asking for an additional $4 million in next year's budget for SAPIS. The renewal part alone of that was originally $2 million add to maintain the current staffing levels we have and an additional increase of another $2 million to hire an additional 25 counselors to reach thousands more children that are in need. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your testimony today. I was actually having a conversation with someone the other day about the, um, when I went to school, the police department would come by with a briefcase. I don't know if you remember. Yes. With, uh, the yes, event. it was the jail program. Yes, yes, right. yes, yes. But I found that it scared the bejesus out of me, right? Because it, I had never really come in first face-to-face uh, -face contact with a lot of the, uh, the drugs that they brought to the school for us to uh, kind of review. But thank you again for uh, your testimony today. and. We look forward to having many more conversations thank in the next few months. Us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well. Thank you, guys. This meeting is adjourned.